unconditional love is the thing that's going to allow us to hear one another, to listen to one another, and recognize the humanity in each other. Hello and welcome to Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 269. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here on a weekly basis to take your health to the next level. Each week, we will bring you inspiring and informative conversations about health and wellness, covering topics of nutrition, lifestyle, fitness, mindset, and so much more. And this week, we have Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. back on the show. He's a Toltec master of transformation and a direct descendant of the Toltecs. By combining the wisdom of his family's traditions with the knowledge gained from his own personal journey, he now helps others realize their own path to personal freedom. Miguel's latest book is The Seven Secrets to Healthy, Happy Relationships, co-authored by Heather Ash Amara, and we are going deep on relationships today. We're so excited to have Miguel back on the podcast. Be sure you go back and check out episode 111. And as Jesse said, we're going into relationships today, so here is some of what we cover. We talk about the beauty of unconditional love. How conditional love is a consequence of domestication. How to break up with your judge. Why no is just as powerful as yes. Letting go of fear. Give yourself permission to heal. And how forgiveness is the final step in healing. Lots of beautiful words. We're so excited for you guys to hear this conversation. And here we go with Miguel. Hi, Miguel. How are you? Welcome back to the show. Hi, Marty. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Hi, Jesse. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's great to have you back on the show, Miguel. Ah, it's a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me back. It's been a couple of years. It has. It has. And this time we're focusing on your new book, The Seven Secrets to Healthy, Happy Relationships, which is obviously very timely and very relevant because Jesse and I are in a relationship. And this is something that we really want to get into on the podcast. We've touched upon relationships a couple of times, but this is going to be a great chat. And we recently got married too, so very timely. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hey. And just to give the listeners an idea, the seven secrets are commitment, freedom, awareness, healing, joy, communication, and release. And we're going to be touching on some of these throughout the conversation. We're just excited to get into all things relationship with you today. Well, thank you so much. It's, uh, we don't live isolated in a monastery. We don't live isolated in an ashram. We don't live isolated in a mountain. We are part of a community. and We're in relationship continuously. So we're always part of something. And when it comes to romantic relationships, we bring to that relationship that which has nurtured us. So I can't give what we do not have. So to me, relationships are the expression of love. And, you know, we're doing the best with what we've got. <laughs> well, I think a great place to really get into things is talking about unconditional love. And in your view, unconditional love is the key ingredient to healthy and happy relationships. So I'd love for you to explain what you mean by unconditional love and why it's so important. Love, let's just say that love is the energy that creates a bond. You know, that's the thing that brings us together, you know, as individuals. And that love can be expressed in many, many ways, as complicated or as diverse as the individual is. I always like to use the image of love as energy. Let's imagine energy flowing like a river. Let's imagine a river, in my case, the Truckee River that flows from Lake Tahoe onto Pyramid Lake and goes from the Sierra Nevadas up in the Sierras in the forest into the desert uh, that surrounds Pyramid Lake. Unconditional love is allowing that water, that river, to flow freely up and down with the seasons, with the spring and the summer and the fall and the winter, uh, ebbs and flows, but it's flowing freely. Unconditional love is that river flowing. Conditional love, let's just say that we fear those stages where that energy flows a little slowly with drought, whatever. So we decide to put a reservoirs or dams all across those rivers. And we put those thinking that if we save it, it'll be fine. You know, but all the reservoirs and dams come with a floodgate. And these floodgates only open if certain conditions are met, which means the only time we get to feel the flow of that river flowing is when the conditions are met. Otherwise, we've closed those floodgates. In essence, imagine putting those reservoirs and dams all across that river several times over. Conditional love only wants to see what it wants to see. If you live up to the expectation, you're worthy of love. And in my case, Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., if I want to be worthy of love, 
I have to live up to the four agreements. And if I don't live up to the four agreements, then I'm worthy of the castigation of my rejection, something we know as domestication. So you can say that in the Totec tradition, there's nothing to learn. It's all about unlearning, unlearning to let go. So we can say that we slowly begin to take out those dams, those reservoirs, little by little, until that river flows once again. So unconditional love is the willingness to see life as is, the willingness to see myself as I am. I am the sum of every decision that I've ever made, and at the same time, I'm the youngest I will ever be. Unconditional love is the willingness to express my love without any fear, to share it with the people in my life. Yes, to learn from the experiences and the consequences of the past, but to no longer be afraid to say goodbye or not, no longer be afraid to say hello. Yes, love, there is consequences. There are boundaries that we create and set, and basically those boundaries are the lines by which we take care of ourselves, we protect ourselves. But conditional love set those boundaries with protecting the ego rather than protecting the self. When we have that self-respect for ourselves and we're able to love ourselves just the way we are, to see ourselves as unique as we are, then we're able to extend that with the people in our life, to love them, to willing to see them for who they are, not project a mask onto them or project onto a mask of what we think they should be, but see them for who they are to see them as a human being that doing the best with what they've got. So for me, that's unconditional love, the willingness to engage the person in front of me. It's not about getting to know women or men. It's about understanding the person that's in front of you. Who is this person? And like I said before, I can't give what I do not have. In order for me to know this person in front of me, I'm going to use what I've used to get to know the person that I am, to know who I am, to accept who I am, and engage who I am allows me to get to know the person, to engage the person, to love the person that's in front of me. Well, in the book, you talk about two things that get in the way of unconditional love, and you've mentioned both of them, domestication and conditional love. And I want to take some time and get deeper into domestication and what this is. Well, domestication is a system of reward and punishment by which we model the behavior of an individual. If they live up to the expectation, they're worthy of love. If they don't live up to expectation, they're worthy of the punishment. When they live up to expectation, that reward feels like acceptance, feels like love, because we are our beings who experience emotions. And that's why it feels like love. That's why it feels like acceptance, which means that the punishment we get for not living up to expectations feels like rejection, which is the lack thereof of love. I take myself as the example. Hello, my name is Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., I don't take things personal. I don't make assumptions. I always do my best. <gasps> I forgot the first agreement. Oh, no. How can I call myself Don Miguel Ruiz Jr.? And there's the diatribe of judgment, self-judgment, for not living up to the expectation of Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. In order for him to be worthy of love, he always has to live the four agreements. Don't take things personal. Don't make assumptions. Always is does his best. And he's impeccable with the word. If he lives up to that image, he's worthy of love. But if I forget... For example, the fifth agreement, oh no, and the judgment comes in, judging myself for not living up to expectation, now I'm rejecting myself. At that point, I'm using the image or the name Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. to love myself conditionally, and I can't give what I do not have, which means, imagine my wife standing next to me, honey, you're Mrs. Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., here's the four agreements, read it. And with that judgment, Honey, you didn't read the book. How can you take things personal? Honey, I only hang out with people who are impeccable with their own word. Then we're judging them for agreements they never made, but we're forcing them to make the agreement through the judgment. So domestication is the way we model ourselves to live up to an image that doesn't exist, something we can call the shadow self. We create an image of ourselves and we try to live up to that image only because we think that's the only way we're worthy of love. So we can say that that becoming aware that that's what we're doing. That in this case, I'm corrupting the four agreements and I'm turning them into the four conditions. The telltale sign that we're using the four agreements as an instrument of domestication is judging ourselves for taking things personal, judging ourselves for making assumptions, judging ourselves for all the rest of it. And that's how we can use domestication to love ourselves conditionally and subjugate our own will. Because conditional love is the consequence of that domestication. And we do it with love. I love you if you live up to the image of Prince Charming. Well, I love you if you live up to the image of Winona Ryder. 
we create those images, we project those images, but we never see the human being that's in front of us. So it starts with ourselves to have a moment of clarity, to become aware that that's how we're using our own intent and to see ourselves, to accept that I am a man. My name is Miguel Ruiz, and I do take things personal. I do make assumptions. Sometimes I'm not impeccable with my words. Sometimes I am not skeptical at all. I buy a hook, line, and sinker, and sometimes I don't do my best. Just ask my wife. She's my witness. It's the moment where I stop pretending to be something I am not for the sake of someone's approval. And this brings in the first secret, the foundation secret of commitment, where we need to really be mindful of our inner judge and, you know, really keep that on track because we are first judging ourselves and then we project that outwards and we're judging the people around us. Uh So let's talk about breaking up or letting go of that inner judge. Well, you can say it's like a moment of clarity, you know, like an alcoholic or drug addict that becomes aware of how they've abused their addiction. We become aware that we've abused our own intent, our own word to go against us. And we've used our mind as the active domesticator in our life. So to break up with our judge, to break up with our victim, which is basically the elements of our domestication, that part of us that imposes and subjugates us, we impose upon us conditions by which we subjugate ourselves too. To break up with it is one, to have that moment of clarity where we accept the truth. Like I was saying before, I am a person who takes things personal. I am a person who makes assumptions. I stop pretending to be something I'm not. And who am I? Well, I'm a living being. When we break up with something like our judge or our parasite or our victim, and the parasite is just the mind that's the active domesticator in my life, Is the moment where I make the decision to actually take care of myself for the very first time, to not let a belief or condition dictate who I am, but to see myself, to know myself through the experience of being me. I am the constant in every relationship that I am in. From the moment I am born until the moment I die, every relationship that I am in will end, either by life, by choice, or by death. If we begin to accept that, that everything ends, then why waste our time worrying about what's coming? Let's enjoy the time when we're both saying yes to one another because every relationship exists for as long as we both say yes. And the commitment to myself is the commitment to seeing myself for who I am, to loving myself for who I am, and most importantly, to give myself the permission to heal from the wounds of conditional love left in my heart and in my mind, to take care of me, to heal. And that is what allows me to heal my relationships with everyone in my life. You touched on the fact that all relationships end. And you talk about in the book how this can be a positive thing if we keep it in the proper mindset and realize that life is so precious and it goes by so quickly. And how keeping this in mind can actually improve our relationships in the present. So if you could just further elaborate on that. Yes, because it's the thing that keeps us from taking someone for granted. When we start taking someone for granted is the moment that we forget that they're here because they want to be here. All of a sudden we think that they're here because they have to. And the person who becomes afraid of the no, the person who's afraid of losing someone is the person who's going to domesticate the other one because every relationship exists for as long as we both say yes to one another. If one of us changes that yes into a no, that relationship ceases to exist. When couples come and ask me for advice, I usually ask them, do you want to stay together? If they both say yes, the rest is easy. If they both say no, that's also easy because they're being honest with themselves. The difficult part is when one says yes and the other one says no, because you're trying to convince someone to change that no into a yes or something like that. What allows us to be comfortable to accept that every relationship ends is to Let go of the fear of being alone, because the truth is that we are always alone. No one else lives inside our body but ourselves. No one else lives inside this mind but ourselves. This is me. From the moment I'm born to the moment I die, I am the constant. Every relationship that comes into my life is going to eventually say goodbye. So if we accept that, in the same way we accept our mortality, then instead of worrying about that imminent end, we enjoy the time we're saying yes to one another. 
Because that mutual yes to one another is the thing that allows us to heal. It's the thing that allows us to enjoy. It's the thing that allows us to be present. And it's the thing that allows us to continue, not just to court our beloved, but to get to know who this person is. It's the thing that prevents us from taking someone for granted because we know that our time with this person is limited. And here's the thing, that time that's limited may be for the rest of our life or it may be just a week, but enjoy it. Enjoy it while it's here. And that's the beauty of it. It's the thing that allows us to really enjoy the relationship we're in. So let's talk about what freedom looks like in a relationship. How do we explore having that time for ourselves while also have the ability to come together as a unit? Like we were talking prior about taking some for granted, what keeps us from taking some for granted is that we are aware that the individual that's across from us, the person we're in relationship with, is with us because they want to be. To respect someone is to respect their free will. Your no is just as powerful as your yes. And for as long as you're alive, everything is possible. Is to respect your capability to say yes and no to the things you want to say yes and no to. That's respect. To respect someone to have their choice and to experience the consequences of their choices. So, like I was saying before, when a couple asks me if they want help and I ask them if they want to stay together, they both say yes. That's what makes it easy because they want to be together. You are my equal because you're alive at the same time as I am alive. To respect you is to respect your yes just as much as your no. And I'm only able to give that respect because I'm able to respect my own yes and my own no. My own no is just as powerful as my yes. With that in mind, to set someone free, as the expression goes, if you love someone, set them free, is to respect their capability to make choices in life, to respect them to experience those consequences that their choices trigger, but let them be who they are. Yes, They're here because they want to be here. And at any given moment, they can change. Like my wife. My wife is with me because she wants to be with me. At any given moment, especially if I do something stupid, she has the complete freedom to change that yes into a no. Like my grandma used to say to us kids, I love your grandfather very much, but he's a patch that I can cut up and sew up at any given time. What he means by that is like she can make him a part of her. And at any given time, she can cut him off and He's no longer a part. People are together because they want to be together. So to extend that freedom, which is sometimes the irony of commitment and freedom go to hand in hand, is because one, you're respecting your own freedom. And when you respect that your own personal freedom, you're able to extend that to someone else. It's like learning to say namaste. In order for me, the son in me honors the son in you. I first learned to honor my own son to know what it feels like, to know what the experience is. So when I say the sun in me honors the sun in you, I know what that talks like. So it's basically letting go of the fear of getting our heart broken. Because yes, it'll get heartbroken. We will experience that pain. But if we let that fear dominate us, then that's the thing that makes us cut someone else's wings in the same way we cut our own wings. If we're afraid to be alone, then... We all try to be alone. We, we won't get together with someone because we're afraid of getting our heart broken. And whoever is, has that fear is the one who's going to domesticate the other or be subjugated by you. Please don't leave me. I'll do everything you want. I'll be anyone you want me to be. Just don't leave me. At that point, you're cutting you off your own wings just as much as you're cutting the other person's wings. So if we become aware of that, the secret to awareness, because this is the reason why they're foundational, Awareness is a communion within ourselves and the people around us and the environment around us. It's the willingness to see life as is. Like we were saying before, unconditional love is the willingness to see the person that's in front of us for who they are. That is also means to be honest with ourselves. What triggers us to be afraid? What triggers us to love someone conditionally? And to give ourselves the permission to heal from that. That's why the commitment is so important. I heal with my own permission. And when we heal those old wounds, The thing that allows us to enjoy the relationship that we're in now is that those old wounds are no longer infecting us, which leads us to the other secret of healing, the transformative secrets. Now we're going to take a quick break from our chat with Miguel to give a shout out to our show partner, Four Sigmatic. 
Sometimes it's hard to get all your different varieties of mushrooms in, and that's why the 10 Mushroom Blend is something you may want to consider. This all-in-one mushroom blend has everything from chaga, reishi, cordyceps, lion's mane, shiitake, mataki, enotaki, agaricus, meshima, and trimella. So many different shrooms all in one place. If this is going to make it easier for you to get your mushrooms in, I highly recommend getting your hands on this. And you can also be hardcore and have this straight up just in a cup with some warm water. You can add it to a smoothie. You can add it to a warm beverage. Or you can even mix it into a dessert and hide it in there and such a great way to get your mushrooms in. So if you're overwhelmed with how to get all your mushrooms in, get your hands on the 10 Mushroom Blend to make it easier. And as a listener of our show, you get 10% off all your Four Sigmatic purchases. To take advantage, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Four Sigmatic. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Four Sigmatic. If you're a listener in the US or Canada, you can bundle your order together, spend $100 or more, and you get free shipping. Go and load up on shrooms today. You are going to love them. And now a shout out to our other show partner, Core Chair. If you're still sitting on a regular desk chair, you're going to want to make the upgrade to a core chair. This is the chair that Jesse and I sit on every time we record a podcast and every time we sit at our desk. It is such a comfortable way to get some movement in. It allows for active sitting, which means we're getting more blood flow throughout our body and definitely more blood flow to our brains, allowing us to think better, feel better, and just overall move better. So if you haven't tried the core chair yet, we highly recommend it. This is a good time of year to get your hands on it. It's holiday time and it makes a great gift. So get your hands on the core chair. We guarantee you're going to love it. Speaking of guarantees, when you buy a core chair, you get a 60-day money-back guarantee. So there's no risk involved. We know you're going to love your chair and you're going to want to hang on to it though. As a listener of our show, you get a special discount on your core chair purchase. To find out what that is, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash core chair. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash core chair. If you live in North America, you also get free shipping on your chair. Go and get your core chair today. You are going to love it. And now back to our chat with Miguel. So I want to expand on freedom, but talk about freedom within the context of a relationship. Let's say people are committing to be together. They are both choosing that they want to be together, but freedom within the relationship, meaning One of the partners wants to go off and be with their friends or go explore a new passion or go and travel. How do people, you know, balance this out so that one partner is not feeling neglected or upset? You know, just trying to bring it into everyday examples where people might be feeling this within their relationship. So just making the choice every day to give your partner that freedom to explore their self-identity. We give permission to ourselves first. That's the commitment to ourselves to give us permission to ourselves to actually find out who we are and what we like and what we enjoy. Once we find that for ourselves, we're able to give that permission to someone else. Each of us in the individual in our relationship is that, like parents, the secret that parents don't tell other people who don't have kids is that we don't know what we're doing. We're doing the best with what we've got. In relationships, that's also true. The way we give that freedom to someone else is to realize that This person who we're in relationship with, we like who this person is. We love who this person is. We enjoy who they are. That person is going to change. That person is doing the best with what they've got. They're exploring who they are, what they are, and those things change. When we are raising a child, for example, it's easy to see the changes in that child because they're growing physically They're maturing mentally. They're reaching a certain level of maturity with every birthday. We parents have no idea what we're doing because as soon as we get used to being the parent of a one-year-old, they turn two, they turn four, they turn eight. Every birthday makes it everything we know about parenting relevant because the person in front of us changes. Well, my beloved, my wife, she's growing at the same rate as I am. And sometimes because we're growing at the same speed, kind of like the Einstein's theory of relativity, Sometimes we don't see those changes because we're changing at the same rate at the same time. The willingness to see them for who they are allows us to give them that freedom. Who are they? What are they? Only they are defining that. No one else gets to define it but themselves. So to extend that within a relationship requires the ability to communicate with one another, the ability to understand one another, and more importantly, to listen to one another. The thing about relationships is that they're constantly changing because the two people in that relationship 
are also changing. My wife and I have been together for 14, almost 15 years now, and we've been changing. She's not the same person she was at the age of 28, 30, 40. She's evolved because life has happened. When we met, we weren't parents to anyone. Now we're parents to two teenage kids, and life has impacted us in that way. Now we've got two dogs who are also impacting us. We're changing. She wants to work. Great. I work. Great. We both help each other find that common ground. Now, if we let our domestication dictate how that relationship should be, then, you know, as a Mexican-American, I'll say, no, you have to stay at home and not work. Or she grew up Mormon, and she wants me, no, well, I only love you if you become Mormon. I do the same thing with her being Catholic. At that point, we let the conditions that we grew up with dictate the relationship. And we're not really in relationship with the individual. We're in relationship with conditions. And that goes back to the commitment, what we're domesticated with. But here's the thing about relationships. The only thing that exists between you and I, in case I'm projecting my wife, the thing that exists between she and I are the things we both say yes to. Just like giving her the personal freedom to say yes to the things she wants to say yes to and no to the things she wants to say no to. I give that to myself, which means the only thing that will exist between she and I are the things we mutually say yes to one another. So the willingness to hear each other, to understand each other, is the thing that's going to allow us to create that personal freedom. My stepmom asked my wife last year before my mom passed away, my stepmom, she said, how did you handle the culture clash? Because she and I grew up in two different worlds. She grew up in Utah. I grew up in California. And she grew up in the farm. I grew up in the big city. And my wife answered her very beautifully. Because we love each other. Because we love each other, that's the motivator that allows us to solve the problems between she and I. It's the thing that separates someone from casually just dating to someone who is in a fully committed relationship because we love each other so much that we're willing to find the common ground in order to solve the problems where we don't agree with one another. We are willing to agree. We are willing to find that common space. We are willing to hear each other. And from that point, we're willing to take care of one another. And that's what allows us to find that common space. If my wife wants to go and hang out with her girlfriends, she can totally do that. She and I will set up a schedule where I take care of the kids that weekend. I don't go to work. I stay here. And she goes off in a weekend where she recovers. For me, my recovery time is going on a half marathon race or a full marathon race. So for example, this weekend, we've been planning it for several months now, how I'm this weekend, I'm going to take off, go for a run. Because to me, going for a run makes me happy. And she will stay with the kids that weekend, and I will do that. And sometimes we want to go off together. Then we will try to arrange someone to take care of the kids. But we find the way. And the willingness to find that way, the willingness to listen to one another, to find that peace in the middle of a culture clash, well, the motivator is love. The motivator that is unconditional love is the thing that's going to allow us to hear one another, to listen to one another, and recognize the humanity in each other. Well, you talk about finding that common ground. What do you do in cases where one person's a yes and the other person's a no, and you really can't find that common ground? Even if you're really having great communication, you're really listening to your partner, but you're just bumping heads and not finding that common ground. I like first describing what harmony looks like. Harmony is where we both mutually respect each other. That your yes is as powerful as your no, and to respect you is to respect your no, just like I respect my own no. But eventually, I'm going to get attached to a yes, and I want that yes, and you're saying no. The ability to have respect for one another is to try to persuade the other person to change that no into a yes, but always knowing that no means no. No always does mean no. That's something we respect between each other. But if I become so attached to that yes, that's when I'm going to be tempted to domesticate her because the only way I can get that yes is if I control her will. And the only way I can control her will is for her to give me permission to control it. And in order for me to get that permission, the only way I can get that 
is for her to doubt herself, to get her to doubt who she is. And that's what domestication is. That's where that harmony ceases to exist and this respect comes in. That's when domestication really comes to rule a relationship because I want it my way. I know my son likes this. He's been singing this song quite a bit. So it's Veruca Salt. I want it now. I don't care how I get it. I want it now from Willy Wonka. Some people just grew up that the only way they can get what they want is to throw a tantrum and to disrespect everyone else's choice. And that's the problem we've been having. The biggest problem people have in relationship is who's going to domesticate who. But if you're able to maintain that mutual respect, if you're able to accept the truth, I don't control my wife. I don't control her perception. I don't control her will. She does. And she doesn't control my perception. And she doesn't control my will. I do. Then both she and I only control to the tips of our fingers. In a relationship, yes, we will have disagreements. But the willingness to find that common ground is the thing that's going to keep it, well, in mutual respect. Yes, if there's two things that are so strong that we are going to fight and argue with one another. You have to understand there's a point where it stops being about what I want and it starts being about control. And the moment it becomes about control is the moment where we no longer respect who they are. So the willingness to keep listening and understand that not everything in our life is going to go my way. I'm able to respect life because life has all the right to say no to me. Life has all the right to say no, but I'm going to work very hard for that opportunity when life says yes. My wife has all the right to say no to me, but I'm going to be ready for that moment when she says yes. So Miguel, when you realize you can't find that common ground between you and your partner, is agreeing to disagree an acceptable conclusion? Of course. It's a choice. At that moment, you have to ask yourself, is this worth putting our relationship at risk? My wife and I developed the art of arguing with one another. Part of the culture clash we were talking about, nothing brings out a culture clash like raising a child. And also a financial crisis like we had in 2008. We were arguing quite a bit. Eventually, we began to learn to argue with one another. My grandpa always told me, if you're about to put your foot in your mouth, button your lip. If you already put your foot in your mouth, button your lip even harder. So there are times when I was arguing with my wife and we were yelling and screaming. And I caught myself about to say something very, 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 very stupid. And what that is, is something that's going to hurt her. Because when we fight with one another, when we argue, especially when we're going to get away, we somehow tend to navigate or steer the conversation over to an argument we know we can win. And that's what we should go back to the past. And we stop arguing about what we're actually arguing about. We go to our safe bet winning argument. And we both do it. So I'm about to say something very, very stupid. And I catch myself. And instead of saying it, and I know I don't have the discipline at the time to stop myself from it, I walked away because I didn't want to say it. I buttoned my lip. My wife at first followed me and I would have the explosion. And eventually I told her, love, I'm walking away because I just caught myself about to say something very stupid that's going to hurt you and I don't want to say it. So I'm removing myself from it in order to defuse the situation. Susan said to me, Well, to me, when you walk away, it sounds like you're not giving merit to what I'm saying, that you're disregarding what I'm saying. And I said, honey, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm not even doing that. I'm walking away because I'm about to say something that's going to be so hurtful that I don't want to hurt you. She said, okay, I hear you. I understand you. But let's make this agreement. You walk away and you take your time to defuse. But when you defuse, come back and re-engage. And what happens is that when we re-engaged, That emotional reaction that was about to happen, what happened is that when we have that emotional reaction, the first thing that goes out the window is the willingness to listen because I want to win. I want it my way. I was able to defuse. The thing that happened was I listened to her from her point of view. And somehow she also defused and she was listening to me. It's the thing that allowed us to separate 
arguing about economics from our relationship. If we disagree in economics or something financial, it has nothing to do with our relationship. It took us a couple of years to figure out that a disagreement in our finances doesn't mean that I don't love her or she doesn't love me. It means that we just see different things in that aspect. And then we were able to translate that into our relationship with our kids. So now when we argue, we know the difference between apples to apples, oranges to oranges, and banana to banana. I'm using that analogy because we're able to separate finances, relationship, and children. Because sometimes when we're arguing, the emotional reaction gets triggered, and we can't see the difference between any of it. The willingness to find that common ground, to understand that we're talking about different things, came from the ability to listen. That if she sees spending this kind of money on that, and I said, no, let's spend it on this, that has nothing to do with our relationship. If we help uh, talk about how to, with my son who has autism, should we do this therapy or should we do that therapy? The willingness to listen to one another allows us to find what's the correct solution. And when she and I are able to talk about each other, well, it's a totally different thing. In fact, Susan and I haven't argued about our relationship in a long time. Like we've been able to separate the two, the three actually, topics. And that took work. But that's because we were able to somehow disengage our emotional reaction to become aware of what triggers us not to listen to one another and allowed us to create a whole new culture together, a whole new language that even now we can give nonverbal signals to one another and we know what we're talking about. It took us a long time to do that. And I think this is a really important point to expand on is the ability to cultivate listening skills. How can we start to develop this better and better? Most people, when they're in a conversation or an argument, they're just thinking about their next thought, their next point. They want to prove themselves right, prove the other person wrong. So let's talk about how we can start to harness these skills and become a better listener. Well, if you pay attention to what you said, most people, when we're in an argument, if we're paying attention to what we're going to say next or what we're going to introduce the next time it's my turn to talk, I'm not listening to that person. I'm not listening to my beloved. Get to know your triggers. What triggers you to stop listening to someone else? If you think that my love has to always agree with me, then I'm sorry, that's domestication. There are many things that my wife and I don't agree with, and that's fine. We just didn't allow it to affect our relationship between us. And we realized that the thing that keeps us motivated to engage one another is the mutual love we have for one another. So you can say that it requires the willingness not just to listen to one another, but to be even able to create a whole new language with one another. For example, in the middle of doing this workshop or working towards this book, I had a class and I asked this young lady to come up to the stage and I asked her, what do you want out of a relationship? And she said, I want it to be stable. And I paused it right there. Okay, let's hold off on that. I asked the rest of the class to write down what that means to them. What does it mean to you? I want a relationship that's stable. So everyone, when they finish writing it, I asked them to read out loud what they wrote. And all of them had a different variation, including one who said, a place where you put horses in. That's what a stable is. So I told the young lady, you said it to yourself, I want it to be stable. To you, that meant that one thing that you meant. You just heard 15 different versions and none of them sounded the way you thought it meant, even the one that was a horse. So imagine you're talking to your beloved and you say, I want our relationship to be stable. And your beloved says, yes, I want that too. Then years later, you're going to be heartbroken because you both said yes to two totally different things, even though you said the same wording. So here's the thing. Words are empty symbols whose meaning and definitions are subject to agreement. A phrase like, I live in a red state here in the United States. That phrase in the 1950s meant that you lived in a state that both socialist, communist, and fighting words, depending who you say that to. In 2018, I live in a red state means that you live in a state that both conservative, Republican, and fighting words, depending who you say that to as well. The phrase remained the same, but the culture changed so much that the meaning changed. So here's what my father always taught me. 
I'm responsible for what I say. I'm not responsible for what you hear. Because you might have grown up in a totally different world or a different community where that same phrase means something different to you. The willingness to listen to one another is also the willingness to create a language that allows you to understand each other. One of the biggest mistakes we can ever make is thinking that the other person thinks the same way we do. We both come from different parts of the world. We even come from different communities within different families, which means that we grew up knowing life as unique as we grew up. The ability to create, to bridge the two worlds is to not only ask, what does that mean to you? What is the phrase, I want a a relationship that's stable, mean to you? All of a sudden, we are able to see it from someone else's point of view. That allows us to create that harmony. Now we're going to take another quick break from our chat with Miguel to give a shout out to our show partner, Thrive Market. Thrive Market is the best way to get your online shopping done. It's got all your favorite health food products all in one place. And it doesn't matter whether you are vegan, paleo, gluten-free, grain-free, AIP, the categories of options are endless. And Jesse and I actually just recently got a box full of goodies that we love. And this included things like coconut butter, coconut oil, coconut aminos. Jesse loves the wild meat bars that you can get at Thrive Market. Dark chocolate, always a staple for us. Sardines, coconut flour, cassava flour, tiger nut flour. The list goes on. And the best part is you're getting all of these products at 20 to 50% off of regular retail value. You're saving so much by shopping online at Thrive Market. And as a listener of our show, you're going to get an extra 25% off your order, plus free shipping and a 30-day free trial. This is such an incredible offer, and it's really easy for you to take advantage. All you need to do is go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Thrive Market. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Thrive Market. Go and put your first order in today. You are going to love what Thrive Market has to offer. And now a shout out from our show partner, Sun Warrior. The liquid light is something that we love to keep on hand. It's such a great way to get an extra dose of minerals in your water. And the best time I like to have it is first thing in the morning. I take a capful, put it in my filtered water, and sip it back. Sometimes I add a little bit of greens in there, or I just have it plain. So if you're looking to get some more minerals in your body, try the liquid light. And as a listener of our show, you get 10% off all your Sun Warrior purchases. To take advantage, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. If you're a listener in the U.S. or Canada, you can bundle your order together, spend $100 or more, and you get free shipping. Go and load up on Liquid Light today. You are going to love it. And now back to our chat with Miguel. And further expanding on this listening topic, an overt way I'm noticing a lot of times these days people aren't listening is because of these electronic devices. So people are on their phone while their significant other is trying to speak to them or on their computer. And it's so easy to get caught up and not be aware of the fact that you're only half listening to what your partner's saying. And I know I'm guilty for this at times where I'll be working away on my computer during the day and Marnie will start having a conversation with me and I'm only giving her half of my attention. So let's talk about some of these interruptions being caught up in the 21st century and all the new electronic devices. It's not new. There's a picture of a young lady riding the subway in New York and everyone else is in their newspaper and she's the only one person without a newspaper engaging the world. It's something that our attention only goes so far. Right now, a gentleman knocked on the door and he had a sign and he wanted my attention. I told him, I can't right now. I'm in the middle of an interview. And he was, oh, okay, I, I get it. And he let it go. The ability to express to one another what our time is or what we're able to give attention to is important. I'm an author. So you can say that, yes, there's devices. Yes, there's a computer. But I'm using a computer to write a book. So when I'm writing and my wife sees that I'm working and she thinks, oh, I'm at home, it means that I'm available to do things. To her, if I'm home, it means that I am able to help her. It took us a long time to realize that if I'm working on a computer, it usually means that I'm either answering someone's email or most of the time writing a book. I'm working on a book. So... At first, it was a source of arguing with one another. Like, no, you're at home. You need to help me. But honey, I need to work. It took us some time to develop the understanding with one another 
that at this very moment, my time, I'm giving my attention to this particular project. The thing about having a cell phone or being distracted by social media on a phone is that on the other side, there's also someone else that's trying to hook our attention. Because here's the thing, most of the time, the reason why we're connected to our phone on Facebook, Instagram, all that kind of thing, is that we're interacting with someone else. We're interacting with a friend, with a relative. They don't know that my wife or my kid is trying to hook my attention too. And when I talk to my wife, the person who I'm texting or the person who's interacting with Facebook gets mad. I'm like, hey, why didn't you respond to me quickly? People get upset if you don't give them their attention. It's like Veruca says, I want it now. I don't care how. I want it now. Patience. The willingness to be honest with the person around you. Like I told this gentleman, right now I'm in an interview and the, and the gentleman says, oh, thank you. Well, have a great day. You too. Have a great day. We're polite. Well, I want to continue this conversation of life in the 21st century. And I want to continue it by sharing a quote from the book where you say, today we're entering a new world of relationships, particularly romantic relationships. So I'd just love for you to further elaborate on what this new world is like and how it's changing relationships. Well, the beautiful thing about that is that we're reinventing what relationships are. The only reason why we're reinventing is that we're actually willing to be honest with ourselves. This is the kind of relationship I want. It used to be that you have to let the community dictate what a relationship should be. And most of the time, the fights we have with one another is to make our spouse fit what our community expects us or them to be like. Here's the thing. When I was young... The majority of the fights I had with my girlfriends was the fights my parents were having with one another. Even to a certain point, letting my mom or my dad dictate what I should be telling my girlfriend. And it took me a long time to realize the only two people who have a say in this relationship is me and my girlfriend. In this case, me and my wife. My father and my mom can say whatever they want, but ultimately, the person who has a say, the people who have a say in this relationship is my wife and I, my beloved and I. Because of that, the willingness to let the relationship evolve is the willingness to listen to one another, is to find out what we want out of our relationship. To be willing to say no thank you to someone who doesn't want the same thing as I do. If I'm in a relationship that wants to be a monogamous and I want to be polygamous or whatever, then I have the freedom to say yes or no. If we both want the same thing, to be monogamy, then great. If we both want to have see other people, great, uh, an open relationship, as they say it nowadays. The beautiful thing about that is in talking to one another, we both are able to create what our relationship is going to look like. That's what makes us a co-creator. Because of that, every relationship doesn't have to be a cookie-cutter relationship. It could evolve with the evolution of the two people involved. I'm not the same person I was at 28, and the guy who was me at the age of 28 wanted something dramatically different from our relationship. The guy at 42, who's about to turn 43 next week, me, sees relationships dramatically different. If I only knew then what I know now. Because of that, relationships don't have to fit a cookie-cutter version in the willingness to both engage each other. The natural consequence of that is that our relationship is as unique as you and I are unique. And because of that, the modern relationship changes. Our community is no longer dictating what the relationship should be. We do. She and I do. The willingness to create a whole new culture together. That's what makes it modern. I don't know the way my father and my mother did it. I know what the consequence was. I don't know how my grandparents did it either. I'm living the relationship that I'm living in right now. And that's what makes it unique. Well, let's further expand on this and talk about how a lot of us are unconsciously bringing these old rules and expectations from people like parents, our culture, religion, different aspects from the world into our own relationship. And again, not being even conscious of it necessarily. Well, that's what domestication is. We're domesticated by those cultures, and that's when we let a belief dictate the relationship. And sometimes we're happy if that's what we really want. 
But oftentimes, you know, a lot of couples get divorced because they're not meeting each other's expectations or the community's expectations and parents and family communities are saying it. Then that's the result of domestication. Once again, we're going back to the art of commitment to oneself. What do we want out of life? What do I want out of myself? What do I want to experience in life? When I give myself the permission to heal, to heal from all my old heartbreaks and all kind of thing, I get to see the truth. And what is the truth? Then I don't know what I'm doing. I'm doing the best with what I've got. I'm alive. And because I'm alive, I am capable of engaging the people in my life. And every relationship will bring something different, something unique. I fell in love with a woman, and she and I took us a long time to merge our cultures. She grew up Mormon. I grew up Catholic. She grew up conservative. I grew up liberal. And somewhere in between, we found a culture where we both are raising our children in a world where it's all fused together. When we go to her family's home, we cross our arms and then we pray in that way. When we go to my family's home, we do the sign of the cross and we put our hands together and we, and we pray that way. We respect each other. In that mutual respect, the relationship will take the shape of that mutual respect. But it requires the willingness to respect myself. We keep what has helped us and we let go of what's forsaking us. We let go of the thing that makes us pretend to be something we're not. We let go of the thing that makes us reject ourselves for not being that image of domestication. We keep what actually has helped us, what has actually nurtured us. And that's what gives shape to our relationship. So let's talk about past wounds in terms of relationships that are in our past, that baggage that we may be carrying into the relationship. So not just from cultural influence or things from the past or our parents, but actual previous experience. I think a lot of people do this. They bring in their divorce or their breakup or their ex cheating on them. So what does the healing process look like for people who are still holding on to this in their current relationships? You know, the funny thing about that question is that when Heather Ash asked me to talk and write this work with her, I just finished a whole cycle with my ex-girlfriend and healing each other's wounds. Me and my ex-girlfriend from high school, my, you can say she's my first love. I was 18 and she was 17. We graduated from high school and we loved each other, but we hurt each other. And we hurt each other bad. And what helps you stay friends with your ex is that the willingness not to go back. We don't want to go back. But we still wanted to be in each other's lives. So every time we hung out, we would hurt each other again, again and again and again. Somewhere in my late 30s, after years of doing my own self-work, I began to see it from her point of view. And I stopped blaming her. All of a sudden, I stopped projecting onto her responsibilities for my own self. And all of a sudden I realized that, yeah, I was being quite conceited. I was being really selfish. And I saw it from her point of view. We talked one day, trying to be friends again. And I told her, I'm sorry. Now, there's a difference between I'm sorry of trying to get back together with someone. There's, there's an ulterior motive there. But there's a difference between guilt and remorse. Guilt is punishing yourself for doing something you wanted to do. And if you're given the choice again, you will still do it. But you're still going to punish yourself. That's what guilt is. Remorse is seeing it from someone else's point of view and seeing the hurt you caused and wish you hadn't done it. You all of a sudden realize, oh, I did that. It's owning up the consequences of what I did. Owning my choices and instead of me culpa por mi culpa and all of my culpa, no, it's about I take responsibility. I own this. I did it. And I said, I'm sorry. And I didn't ask for forgiveness. I simply said, I'm sorry. I recognize. And I told her, I did this and I don't blame you for doing what you did either. I'm sorry. You were right. And from there, something incredible happened. Something I've been wanting to hear since I was 18 years old. She admitted what she did as well. We both admitted to one another and we both apologized. Something I wanted to hear since we were 18, how much we loved each other. We both admitted that we would have broken up because we're both in our 40s now. We're like, yeah, we, we know enough that that relationship wasn't going to last. 
but we both owned up to what we did and we forgave each other. But that only happened after we were both willing to own our actions, that we were no longer projecting onto one another, blaming one another, pointing fingers at one another. And also realized in talking that we were just basically hurting each other, revenge, vendetta, because we loved each other. We were hurt and we apologized. Because we were, for the very first time since we were young, we saw each other's humanity. I saw how much I hurt her and she saw how much she hurt me. And we both said, I'm sorry. The person who benefited from that is my wife because that old wound, that all emotional poison is no longer infecting our relationship. It got healed. Of course, this requires the willingness to have someone work with you because People don't heal at your own time. They heal their own time. I learned that one the hard way as well. If you try to press to heal and they're not ready, they're going to trust you even less because you're trying to impose your will upon them again. To respect someone is to let them heal at their own time. And sometimes when life gives you that opportunity, which life gave me that opportunity because she gave me the opportunity, I took it and I was ready for it. You mentioned how you both forgave each other. How big of a part is forgiveness in this whole concept of moving on and healing the wounds? It's the final step. Someone said it beautifully. It's the moment where you stop wishing the past was any different and you accept it for what it is. And you choose to no longer use that poison to hurt yourself ever again. That's what forgiveness is. Some people are afraid to forgive because that means that you're accepting their behavior or you somehow condone it. No, but the thing is is that forgiveness is basically the moment where you're no longer going to use them to judge yourself, to hurt yourself or hurt them or use that emotional poison to blind each other. It's basically accepting the truth and letting go. It's basically the final step in the whole process of healing. All right. So in wrapping up before we completely end, is there any other words or anything you want to share on healthy relationships, something that we didn't cover today? Intimacy, you can say that when we heal our own wounds, the reason why I say my wife was the person who really benefited from that is that we open up when there's trust. When we heal our own wounds, we're able to trust more and we are able to open up. My wife is not my best friend. My wife is my wife. And what I mean by that is that the level of intimacy between she and I goes much, much deeper than any best friend I have. Out of 7.5 billion people, she is the one whom I completely open up to, and I'm not afraid to show who I really am. The secret of joy, the secret of communication, even the secret to release is the willingness to see the person who's in front of me, just as I'm willing to see myself. That's what intimacy is. To no longer be afraid to show who you really are, to be afraid of that rejection, because you're no longer rejecting yourself. Yes, we will learn from the consequences of our life. Yes, we will take that which were mistakes and learn from that and apply it in our life to not commit that mistake again. For me, you know, the lesson I have from healing from my ex-girlfriend, my first love, is that while we both mutually still respect and love each other, we will have that motivator to find that healing between us. My wife and I, We've caused hurt to one another, yet the willingness to heal each other, to be there for one another, to give her time to heal and her own time to respect her for who she is, is the same I give myself. I can't give what I do not have. So intimacy is something that flourishes where trust exists. And the trust is not on someone else because it's like a guard trying to keep someone in jail. You know, it's, it, you're still trapped there. The trust is in yourself. The trust in yourself to make choices. The respect you have for yourself to experience the consequences of your own choices. Like my dear friend Kirk who says, is the juice worth the squeeze? Meaning by that, is the consequence worth the effort? And to me, our relationship is worth the effort. 
Well, Miguel, I really appreciate you sharing that story, your first love, and tying it forward into your marriage and how that has had a positive impact on it. And I think that message is just so important for the listeners. You know, it's a nice thing to be able to heal the past because it allows you to really enjoy the present. Love that. And Miguel, other than listeners getting a copy of your new book, The Seven Secrets to Healthy, Happy Relationships, how can they connect with you after the show? Well, I'm always on my website, you know, MiguelRiz.com or MiguelRizJr.com. Miguel Riz is my father's, but I'm active in Instagram, so I'm, I'm on there the most. Well, we want to thank you so much for coming back on again and sharing this important message about relationships. Well, no, thank you so much for the opportunity to share with you our tradition and to share with you what I've learned for myself. You know, at one point, these were secrets and I didn't know them. And then life happened and now I know them. <laughs> yeah, thank you. We really appreciate all your knowledge. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jesse. Thank you so much, Marnie. Have fun. We hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Miguel, and hopefully you're also inspired to take your relationships to the next level. Lots of beautiful information that we talked about. And in other good news, we're super excited to announce that we just launched our Android app. This is the exclusive app that we have that you can get all of our episodes in one place. We've had it already for the iPhone users, and now we have it for Android users. We're so excited you guys have access to this. It's totally free, and Jesse's going to tell you guys how to get it. Yes, Android users, the time has finally come. Our app is available for you to download, and it's free like Marnie said. Just head over to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Android app. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Android app. Be sure and download it today. And Apple users, the app has been out for quite a while, but to download your copy, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Apple app. For full show notes, be sure and head over to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 269. We have links to everything we discussed in a nice show summary, so be sure and check that out. And before we let you guys go, I want to give some love to our editor and engineer, Jay Sanderson over at podcasttech.com. Jay, thanks for doing such a great job putting the show together. And this week's fun fact about Jace is that he was recently exploring in his new apartment and he found a gym in the basement. Awesome, Jace. I hope you get some good use out of it. Listeners, have an awesome week. We'll talk soon. Take care.